Hey, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Lena for the kind introduction, and I, I really have to admit it's an absolute honor to be able to come here and talk in the GRIT seminar series about something that's very passionate to me, which is, in some sense, the challenges that uh, society brings to engineering. And so I must admit, though, I did get a little depressed when preparing this talk, and I got, I got depressed due to this movie, um, The Field of Dreams. And so the reason why I got depressed is because it reminded me of, of how old I am. And so when I was talking to my grad students about this movie, none of them had actually watched it. And in some sense, some of them had only heard about it. And it, it, I didn't realize how long ago this was. But the reason why The Field of Dreams is slide number one in my talk is for the following reasons. So let me recap a little bit about what the movie is about. So Kevin Costner here is, uh, is actually, uh, you know, he's a farmer. And so basically, what he's, as he's working, he keeps getting these messages. And the, the message that he's getting is the idea that if you build it, they will come. And so what that is in reference to is the idea, well, is if he rips down all his crops and he builds a baseball field in the middle of his crops, right, in the middle of his cornfield, then what will happen is, in some sense, is the, the infamous Black Sox from the early 1900s would actually come back and be resurrected to play baseball in his yard. Okay? So that's, in some sense, the story. And the message is, if you build it, they will come. And the reason why I wanted to put this as slide number one is because I think engineering has many field of dreams on their way. And in particular is when we think about you know, some engineering challenges moving forward, we're going to be talking about revamping our transportation network. We're going to be talking about revamping our energy infrastructure. We're going to be talking about revamping potentially how we do, let's say, matching of residence versus residency programs. This plot, in some sense, shows how the number of available residency programs and the number of residents is kind of diverging, which means, in some sense, you know, demand is higher than supply. Well, how do we do effective matching? Right? And the idea is that when we build this infrastructure, whether it's informational or physical, guess what? Society will come to use it. And what I'm hoping that you get from this talk is that when we try and incorporate society and design, life can get challenging, it can get challenging in a hurry. Okay? And if you don't believe me, let's think about, uh, let's think about uh, uh, something as a, as a simple beauty contest. Okay? As, an, as an illustration of how integrating society into some form of a system can be challenging. Okay? So beauty contests have been around for a long time. And the general premise is, well, what do we want to do is we somehow want to get aggregate opinions, societal opinions, to try and award someone the distinction of the most beautiful. And so economists back in the early 1900s realized that this was fundamentally challenging. Right? Why is it challenging? So they did a little thought experiment. They're like, OK, here's six pictures. But suppose we wanted to start off with 100 and trim it to six. How would we do that? And so, well, one thought, one obvious thought was, well, wait, maybe what we could do is post these pictures in the newspaper, and we could just ask people for their opinions, send in their opinions. But if you think about this from an individual's perspective, why would I want to go through 100 pictures, right, to try and decipher which one is the best one? What's in it for me? So clearly, that wasn't a good thought. And a second idea was, well, maybe what I want to do is I want to pay people, right? And, and then they thought about that a little bit more, and they said, well, that's not reasonable either. Why? Because there's no checks and balances. Meaning, let me just collect the payment, I'll randomly select six people, send it in, and be on my way. So they're like, could we do anything better? And then they're like, well, what if we incentivize people or pay people if they get the right answer? That seemed to have promise. And then they started thinking a little bit deeper about that. And one could imagine, suppose, uh, suppose I have bizarre taste. So I know my tastes aren't aligned with society. Right? I know that. Sorry if my wife is in the audience, but suppose, <laughs> suppose, suppose my beliefs are not aligned for society. What does that mean? It means that if I actually reflect my true preferences, I will not win any money. So what it's going to make me think is, rather than reflecting my true preferences, is somehow make some statement about what I think society thinks is most attractive. And then if I try and play that game a little bit more, I can start thinking, well, is everybody else doing that same thing? And if they are, well, then maybe I'm going to choose to try and put who I think society thinks is going to be most attractive. And so we're getting further and further from what we're after. And so the idea here is, that things are challenging. When we're looking at systems that involve society, even as something is trying to get opinions in a beauty contest, it's fundamentally challenging. Okay? And what we have at our disposal is game theory is really the set of tools to help us understand this. Okay? So I teach a game theory course every year here at UCSB. And a lot of times, at least the undergraduates show up and they think we're going to be studying systems of this form. Right? It has nothing to do with this. What game theory is more relevant is systems of this. 
from transportation to the evolution of conventions to auctions. And really what game theory is is a set of mathematical tools that help us understand how microscopic kind of interactions of decision makers impacts global phenomenon, such as how do individual drivers' behavioral models or how do their drivers impact the emergent traffic patterns? Are those efficient or are those not efficient? Right? And so when we think about what game theory is, game theory is a set of analytical tools to help us deal with systems of this form. What are these systems? These systems consist of three components. Okay? We're going to have decision makers. Decision makers are going to have choices. And each of the individual decision makers is going to have some conditional preferences. Meaning that what I want to do is a function of what everybody else is doing. And likewise, what you want to do is a function of what I'm doing. Those are conditional preferences. And any environment that has these three components we'll refer to as a game. Okay? So clearly, chess is a game. Right? We have the black versus the white. Our available choices are the moves that we can make. And what do we have? Our preferences is to win. Or if I'm playing with my son, the preference is either to win or lose as fast as humanly possible. Okay? Traffic, transportation networks, is also a game. Why is it? Well, we have decision makers or drivers. Drivers have choices under which routes they want to take to go to work or to go to their destination. And what they would like to do is minimize congestion time. Right? But the time it takes me to get somewhere is not just a function of what I'm doing, but also what the other people are doing as well. Whether I choose an efficient keyboard versus an inefficient, or Apple versus Android, is not just about which product is superior or inferior. It's also about what my friends are doing, what my work is doing. Right? So that's also a game. Okay? And so really, we have in a variety of different contexts that, that break the mold of what we traditionally think a game to be. Right? And so what game theory really tries to do is try and bring up the question, given these type of environments, what can we say about what's likely to happen on a global level? Okay? And so this is where John Nash entered the picture. Right? John Nash, uh, in about the 1940s, right, he was a famous economist, a mathematician, and he started thinking about these systems and realizing that one needs to look at these systems through a different lens. And if you haven't heard of John Nash, right, he's, uh, he's the inspiration behind the movie of A Beautiful Mind. Right? And what I would like to do right now is to, to play a clip from The Beautiful Mind, which kind of shows kind of what's a little bit going on. <clears throat> Nash, you might want to stop shuffling your papers for five seconds. I will not buy you gentlemen beer. Oh, we're not here for beer, my friend. Oh. Uh. Does anyone else feel she should be moving in slow motion? Uh. <laughs> will she want a large wedding, you think? Should we say swords, gentlemen? Pistols at dawn? Have you remembered nothing? Recall the lessons of Adam Smith. The father of modern economics. In, uh, in competition, individual ambition, ambition serves, serves the common good. good. Exactly. Every man for himself, gentlemen. Yeah, and those who strike out are stuck with their friends. Yeah, I'm not going to strike out. You can lead a blonde to water, but you can't make a drink. I don't think he said that. All right, nobody move. She's looking over him. Right, she's looking at Nash. Oh, God. All right, he may have the upper hand now, but wait until he opens his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Even when we last time. Oh, yes, that was one of the history books. <laughs> Adam Smith needs revision. What are you talking about? We all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. But what if no one goes for the blonde? We don't get in each other's way, and we don't insult the other girls. It's the only way we win. That's the only way we all get laid. All right, so I'll cut it there. So, but this captures exactly kind of, it's obviously a Hollywood interpretation of it, but it captures this idea of here, what do we have? We have some interactions. Right? We have the decision makers are obviously the guys, the choices are which girl they go after. Obviously, their preferences are quite clear. And so here now one can understand how those microscopic interactions transfer to form more global uh, phenomenon. Like, what is the emergent behavior? Is it efficient or is it not efficient? And if it's not efficient, how can we potentially coordinate or incentivize them to do better? Right? And these are the, these three things, 
right, are really the root of what we're going to try and analyze in all these systems. Right? And so what I would like to do is just spend a little bit of time touching upon how we would talk about what the emergent behavior is. Is it efficient or not? In the context of, uh, you know, in a little bit more general context that we can bring back later. Okay, so these are the three questions. So first of all, with regard to what is likely to emerge, this is where Nash became famous. And what he did is he posed this idea of an equilibrium. He says, we need to think of these systems differently. And the behavior that's likely to emerge is something where everybody is contingent optimizers. Since what I want to do depends on what you do, and what you want to do becomes on what I am, it means that, well, we should, the system should gravitate to a point where everyone's happy, given the choice of everyone else. Right. In a transportation network, this would mean is, you know, I'm going to work on a particular route every day that is, has minimal congestion. And if there were other routes that had smaller congestion, I would naturally gravitate over to them. Okay. So this idea of contingent optimizers was the idea of Nash equilibrium. Right, is the idea behind Nash equilibrium. All right, so now one can ask the question as well, are Nash equilibrium, if these are predictions of what's going to happen in society, and there's a lot of experimental evidence to show that Nash equilibrium do emerge, are they efficient? And one of the problems is, is they're not, okay? And so here's a, here's a classic example of the grand fisheries back in the 50s. And so the idea here is that it was the perception back then that these fisheries just had an endless supply of cod, right? So, you know, in some sense, what happened there is the fishermen all gravitated towards down there. They acted in their self-interest. They gravitated towards, uh, <coughs> towards the, fish, the fish banks. And then what happened is, is, is you also started to see technology start emerge, better fishing technologies and all that. So what happened? Every individual fisherman pursuing their own self-interest actually led to the collapse of, of the fish banks. What do we also see? We also see social norms, is that very frequently we're stuck in inferior conventions. Why? Due to the fact that that just emerged through the idea of, of self-interested behavior. Right? Maybe we're locked into some bad, and the inertia is keeping us there, making it hard to leave. Okay. We can also think about transportation networks. I, I very much like this picture about how here you have the carpool lane zipping by and everybody else waiting, and you know that if you're sitting in the mind of the carpool guy, he's loving this. He's all, this is fantastic, this is the greatest, look at all these people waiting. And the, the mind of everyone else who's waiting are all having the same thought. It's why couldn't they just open the lanes up to everyone, and that way we'd all be able to get to our destination quicker. And so it turns out that in some sense, transportation networks, and we'll see this a little bit more formally later, are highly inefficient. And the idea of having one lane move fast and four lanes moving very slow is more efficient than all lanes moving slow, maybe a little faster than the other way. So all these are mechanisms to, you know, to, to actually make the system work better. Okay? And, but the key here is that when we allow users to respond according to their own self-interest, Right, is that we could get in catastrophic situations such as the grand fishery. Okay? And we could get an inferior, and we gotta, we got to think about correcting that. So with the idea of a, you know, efficiency, things are not overly efficient. The question that emerges next is, well, what can we do about it? Okay? And there's several mechanisms at play that interface with societal members with the goal of trying to improve the underlying outcomes. And here's just a few of them, from eBay, to down at the bottom to, I'm from Colorado, so this is the Boulder Valley School District, some form of an open enrollment process, a process by which they allow parents to potentially get their kids in different forms of schools, to, to United Airlines and handle, they handle the, you know, the overbooking situation. And so the idea is I put up these three as examples of, of places that do things well, that interact with society in an efficient way, and also places that don't do so well. Okay? So eBay is one example of a success story. Right? They understand the dynamics, the game theory, and all that, and they've looked at the math behind self-interested behavior and tried to rectify things, and try to design good systems that operate according to those constraints. And the funny thing is it operates so well that most people aren't even aware of how it actually works. And so let me step you through this. So I'm a huge Bronco fan, so, but we have uh, Bronco Charger tickets, and we have three individuals. We got Homer, we got Ned, and, uh, and Barney who are interested in purchasing the tickets. Right? And the number next to each one of those individuals is how much they value those tickets. And so that's private information, nobody else knows that, but that's how much they're willing to spend on those tickets. And so these guys, once again, are self-interested, and so what their goal is to do is their goal is to get the tickets at the least possible cost and definitely below that value that I've highlighted. Okay? And what are they going to do is, is they're interacting and their choice is how much they choose to bid for the tickets. Okay? eBay, on the other hand, is the, is the system operating 
right? And so they have, a, they have a different way. So they have a different objective. Their objective could be maybe they're trying to maximize social surplus, which means I would like to give the tickets to the person that values them the most. Maybe they're trying to maximize revenue for the, for the seller. They could have a host of different objectives. eBay really concentrates on maximizing social surplus. Is what they would like to do is they would like to give the ticket to the person that values it the most. The problem is they don't know what those numbers are, right? And so the question is, what do they do? Is well, they're going to set forth rules. I'm going to say, please give me a bid that reflects your number. Give me a bid. <coughs> I'm given those bids. I'm going to choose a winner, and then I'm going to offer a payment. And I'd like to derive those rules such that people give me the actual answer. So let's see how eBay works. So imagine, so what happens is, is you have a series of bids. So Homer sends in a bid, Barney sends in a bid, Ned sends in a bid. And those bids could be their true number, it could be something else. And then what eBay does is it says, well, whoever has the highest bid, right, it awards the object to them. Now the question it says is, how much do they pay? And this is where people often don't understand how eBay works. So Ned actually is not going to pay his 175. What Ned's actually going to pay is 80. Right? These are referred to as second price auctions. Okay? You don't pay your price, you pay the second highest price. Right? And so now one can ask is, well, why is it that way? Why wouldn't Ned pay his price? And the reason why is the following. Well, if the auction was in such a way that Ned paid his price, what he would try to do is look at the environment that he's bidding in, and his goal would be to be $1 higher than the, lowest, than the, than the next highest bid. Right? So what would he do is he would push down his bid arbitrarily low, right, to, to where he would just want to get something out. He would know of incentive to bid $250 for the tickets. Why? Because that's the break-even point for him. He would rather go push it down as, 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 as far as possible. Okay? So here, these rules have evolved, and the rules about payments are here to try and get desirable behavior out of the collection. And the reason why eBay is so successful, it's successful for a number of reasons. But actually, the beauty of eBay is really the best thing that an individual user can do is just bid actually your true value. If someone values it more, they're going to get it anyways. But that's the best thing for a user to do. Right? And at the same time, what it will always do is optimize social surplus. So it's a beautiful success story of how eBay took mathematics and took game theory to try and revolutionize the way auctions were done. And this, this, this revolution actually happened in about the 1950s and changed the course of how auctions are done. Okay? And this actually was, uh, you know, one, uh, one got victory of the Nobel Prize, or part of, you know, part of his contribution. So there's other examples of systems that have chose to ignore the mathematics, and as a result, the systems are, are faulty. Okay? Now, Boulder Valley School District, where I was from, is one example of a system that chose to ignore the interactions of strategic, or ch choose to ignore the mathematics of strategic interactions. So what is, what is the story here? The story here operates under the following light. So the idea here is that the elementary schools have a number of open spots. And there's a whole, a whole bunch of demand for parents to move their kids from one elementary school to another. There's more demand than supply, so the question is, well, how do you allocate students to spots? And so what Boulder Valley School District said is, provide us a ranking of your top three choices, and then we'll enter that in the lottery. And the problem with that is, is that the way their lottery was conducted was in such a way that every parent knew right, that what I should do is I should manipulate my rankings. Right? My top spot might be very limited, and it might be high demand. So putting that as my coveted top spot in the rankings will very much hurt me. Right? So what I should do is artificially manipulate my ranking to put a good school at the top right? with the idea of playing around with the rules that the lottery that gave. Right? So what, it, what happens is, is parents are playing these hypothetical games of here's really where I would like to get my kid to school. Right? But I have to manipulate the ranking to try and play with the lottery that's at play. And so it's really not beneficial for the, stu for the, for the parents, definitely. And it's also not beneficial for BVSD. Right? As the school district would like you to report a true ranking, right? but the current lottery-based system that they're implementing doesn't do that. Another one is, is obviously United. So United overbooks their flights, and then they have to deal with the consequences of what happens when too many people show up. And so typically, what do they do? They run some form of, we'll give a, a $100 voucher for anyone that volunteers, a $200 for voucher, and they raise it up. Well, what happens when nobody actually volunteers to take that voucher? You have something that looks like this, right? Eventually, they randomly pick someone, and whether you want to go or not, they take you off the plane, right? And now, so this is how us, you know, interactions with a societal system can go bad, 
right? And in fact, as if you look at recent articles, they just show that really this is united ignoring the mathematics behind strategic interactions. There's far more efficient ways that they could have done things. Okay, so those are some examples of kind of how we can think about Right, you know, what is the emergent behavior? Is it desirable or not desirable? And potentially thinking about a variety of different hosts who've done things right and then maybe have done things wrong. Okay, so for the last part of this talk is what I'd like to do is I'd like to go into a little bit more of the mathematics behind this at just a very high level to try and understand how things could be done. Right, and here we'll use transportation, transportation networks as our playground and we want to kind of understand how strategic interactions might impact efficiency in the design of transportation networks or in the operation of transportation networks. Okay. Since our focus is on trying to understand the impact of strategic interactions, right, we don't want to think about the fine-grained models of cars and stuff like that. We really want to abstract out a lot of those details to try and get at it. And so what we'll do is we'll make some simplifying assumptions about what the underlying network model did and what the underlying decision-making model of the drivers looks like as well. Okay, so when we think about the network models, we're going to go, we're going to represent a transportation network by a graph. Okay, and what we're going to have is we're going to have some set of, you know, some flow, we'll call it a flow, which could be just some, you know, mass of drivers that want to utilize this underlying network. And they want to get from their source to their destination, and the edges correspond to the routes at which they can take to get to their source to the destination. Now, the routes are different, and the routes have their own congestion function that is a function of the amount of flow that's on there. So typically what would we assume is more flow, more cars are going to have more congestion. And so here we see that the top link has a congestion function that depends on the flow in a linear way. Meaning, so for example, if everybody goes on the top route, the congestion then on that top route would be one, right? The bottom flow doesn't have that property. Maybe the bottom edge has this property that regardless of how many people are on there, the congestion is always going to be one. So you can think of the bottom as, as, a, as, as in some sense like a superhighway. Okay, so for example, if the flow was split so that there's 50% on the top and 50% on the bottom, the congestion experienced on the top would be 0.5 units, whatever units are in this particular case, and the congestion experienced on the bottom would be 0.1. So that's going to be our network model. We're going to think about a network as a graph, and each edge in that graph is going to have some form of a congestion or latency function that's dependent upon the flow. Okay. <coughs> now, what's our driver behavioral model? We're going to just assume that drivers are going to try and minimize their own congestion. So what does that mean is we're going to think about this unit of flow that's going into our network as a continuum of drivers where each of the infinitesimal dr small drivers is all about trying to minimize their own experience congestion. Okay, and we want to start playing to see what happens. Okay, so one of the reasons why I love looking at transportation networks is because things get really interesting, right? And there's two really interesting properties about it. The first one is that, well, if we allow just drivers to operate under their own accord, so minimize their own congestion, life can be very bad from a system-wide perspective. And in fact, the example that we previously looked at actually highlights this. So let's think about this underlying network, and let's try and think about, you know, suppose there was God who could command everybody and could divide this, this unit of flow up however he wanted. What's the best he could do? And here we could dust off our calculus book, and we could look at, well, the best that he could do is to divide things up in this fashion. Send 50% of the people high, send 50% of the people low. Okay? And this would yield an average congestion of three-fourths. Why would it yield an average congestion of three-fourths? Is Well, half the people are getting a congestion of a half, half the people are getting a congestion of one, so the average of that is three-fourths. Okay? Now we want to ask ourselves about, well, would this be stable if individual drivers were doing making self-interested decisions? Okay? And the answer would be, well, let's, let's think about it. So a driver on the top route has experienced a congestion of one half. Does he have an incentive to switch to the low route? The answer is no. Why the low route has a congestion of one? So he's happy. In terms of Nash, he's a contingent optimizer. Given the current flow of traffic, he has no desire to switch from the high to the low. Now, what do people on the low route? Well, the people on the low route are currently experiencing a congestion of one. They see the high route has a congestion of 0.5, what's going to happen is they're not going to be too happy. And in general, what you're going to start seeing is traffic flowing up, right? People are going to gravitate from the bottom route to the top route. Okay, and in essence, when, you know, if we let this process play out, what we will ultimately see is all the traffic gravitate to the top route. And this will be, in some sense, an equilibrium. Why is it an equilibrium? Well, everybody's a contingent optimizer. 
They're all getting a congestion of one. If they switched, they would still be getting a congestion of one. Everybody's happy, right? Now, notice that people got worse in this process, but this is where the system would go, right? And so here, everybody's getting a congestion of, three, of one, so the average congestion is one. So what do we have is we have, well, looking at transportation models, even when we have drivers minimizing their own congestion, guess what? This can lead to significant degradations in system performance as a whole. Here, we lost 33% performance, and we were dealing with just a simple two-link network. Another, another interesting property about transportation networks is that naive ways to improve them need not actually work. Okay, so let's look at these two networks on the board. So they're slightly more complicated than the networks that I brought up previously, but, but we can analyze them in a similar fashion. So here, the only thing different is that the network on the right has an additional edge, it just has an additional edge, and this edge was designed beautifully. It sits in the middle, right? It sits in the middle, and it has a congestion of zero, meaning that if you get to the top edge, you can go to the bottom for free, right? So the engineer who designed this link did a fantastic job. Right? And now, adding resources should definitely make life better. Does it? Well, so, you know, it's pretty easy to see that if we looked at selfish behavior on the network on the left, they would divide, 50% would be on top, 50% would be on bottom, the average congestion would be 1.5. Well, the network on the right exhibits something more different, something more fundamental. Is what, what happens is, is the people go to the top, they go down the, the lane, and then they go over to the right. Okay, so what happened here is that we added resources and life got worse. And why did life get worse? It got worse because users were inherently self-interested. Okay, and so this kind of shows you some of the issues that come up when we have to deal with this system. The thought would be is that adding resources is going to make life better. And what did we actually see is adding resources made life worse. Why? Because it didn't account for the potential societal interactions. <coughs> So here's kind of, you know, these are the two takeaways. And so one of the research thrusts that's been going on in my lab is could we derive robust mechanisms for influencing transportation, right? Could we, could we have mechanisms that are actually going to work well, even under uncertainty about our system? And so here I'll, I'll think about the direction is we took transportation and we modeled it as a simplistic graph, right? Now, we don't expect these models to actually reflect it to reflect the true transportation network in its whole, but we expect it to give us insight. So we're going to analyze these, you know, more general than two linked networks, but we're going to analyze these in detail, and we're going to develop some intuition about what happens. And then with that, we're going to go back and take that intuition in the real world. Okay, so with that, we started off with the field of dreams, and we showed that there's all these different examples where we need to be careful, right? Some takeaway points are just that. Right, is that you know, the engineers are responsible for creating the, the, the systems that are going to meet our societal demands in the future, and one needs to really pay attention to that in detail. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your attention.